Okay, g'day all. Uh, welcome to another tutorial. So, it's been a little while. I was really busy doing something. And it seems like it must be done. So, what we're going to look at today is a little bit uh, a little bit off topic. It's not really designed at any specific language. Uh, but any object-oriented programming languages sort of uses these. So, you know, Java, C Sharp, C++. Uh, they're all the same, pretty much. I'll be using C++ code in these examples. But uh, hopefully, you know, don't be off-put or put off if you program in a different language. Uh, I want to also mention that I've made another channel. Yeah, a music channel. And if I remember, I'll put a link to the new channel in the description for this video. So I'm going to put up um, a bunch of tutorials on music theory and maybe history. And I'm probably going to play a few tunes and that sort of thing. So if you're into music, go over and have a look. Anyway, getters and setters is what we're talking about today. Uh, sometimes it's best not to give ourselves and other programmers direct access to a class's variables. And what we do instead is create these methods called getters and setters. So a getter method returns some value from an object. And these are sometimes called accesses. Uh, because they access member variables from an object. And then there's also setters. And these uh, these set the value for, of an object. So sometimes these are called mutators because they change the member variables. I just call them getters and setters myself. Uh, they usually or they're often very basic uh, methods which do nothing more than add a layer of abstraction between the programmer and the class's member variables. And what's important, I think, and what I really want to try to illustrate if I can, is not so much what getters and setters are. Because that's easy. I've done that already. This is one slide. A getter returns a value, a setter sets it. It's easy. Uh, but the important thing about them is why that's useful or how to use them. So that's mostly what we're going through. Alrighty, so a little outline of what we're going to do in this shoot. Um, yeah, I want to illustrate why programmers use getters and setters. So we're going to look at a bit of a scenario of how getters and setters might save a project from uh, ultimately failing, really. That's going to be the first thing we look at. And uh, this scenario will probably illustrate the, the main use for getters and setters, I guess, or one of the most important uses. Uh, but we're also going to look at validating input with a setter, creating read-only member variables with a getter, uh, debugging with assertions. So validating input and debugging with assertions is kind of the same. Whoops, same thing. Uh, but we're also going to look at computation rather than uh, storing everything in RAM. So you can do that with getters as well. It's a pretty interesting interesting way to use them. Okay, so first of all, the scenario. Uh, I want you to imagine that you've got a, a class called car. Uh, pretty simple class in this example. It's got a public int called fuel. And you happen to be in a team that's uh, working on this very large project. There's many, many other programmers. And this particular class, this brilliant little class with a single integer called fuel, uh, is integral to the project. As development of the project proceeds, this particular variable uh, for any number of different instances of the car class all over the project, uh, this variable is changed thousands of times all through the project. Just, yeah, perfectly normal. The uh, public fuel variable is changed thousands of times. And in addition to the team in-house or the uh, the local team that's working kind of all together, there might be a bunch of DLLs or other libraries being developed by external programmers, uh, which are sent over whenever they're completed and uh, linked at runtime with the project, and for which the internal team that you work as part of, uh, the internal team doesn't even have the source code to these DLLs. So the DLLs are also changing the uh, car's fuel variable. Yeah, so some other programmers working completely externally are also developing parts of the project and they're also changing this fuel variable. So it might look something like this. You've got a bunch of internal project files uh, that the local team's working on, yeah, a bunch of the main project files, and here's your, your car class in the middle. And uh, all of the internal project files and programmers, well, they're free to write code that changes the int fuel, as well as the external programmers. So there's a bunch of other people external. They may be in different countries. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but they're all writing different DLLs for different things. Who knows? You might have some experts working on particular parts of the program. 
uh, that live and work, work elsewhere. So they're going to send over your DLLs, uh, but their DLLs are also changing the fuel variable. Fair enough. Perfectly normal. Okay, but here is the problem. After a couple of months of development and a million or more lines of code, some internal lines, some external lines, the boss walks up to you and he says, we need a fuel gauge variable that changes every single time the fuel variable changes. <laughs> We're in really big trouble. I think... I think we need to find every single time that the fuel variable changes in the entire project and make sure that this new variable that the boss wants, this fuel gauge variable, we have to make sure that that is also updated at the same time. And if we accidentally miss just a few times, the two variables are going to slip out of sync and we're going to get bugs. What's more, and what's even worse, is that we don't even have the source code for the DLLs that are being developed externally. You know, that belongs to external engineers. They're not just going to give us the source code unless we pay for it or whatever. Uh, but maybe they haven't got the, uh, you know, ability just to send over the source code whenever we request it. So the external engineers that don't even work inside the company, uh, they're also going to have to be told that the fuel gauge variable needs to be changed every single time the fuel variable needs to be changed. And I'm sure that what you can see is that this is a complete nightmare. This is absolutely terrible, and this kind of problem could easily ruin a project. The project, in the end, is going to become really, really unstable really quickly. If we go through the whole thing and try and change all of the uh, references to fuel and add this second line to change fuel gauge as well, and we try and tell all of the external engineers that they've got to do the same thing, eventually that's going to fall apart. It's not going to work in the long term. It's just not. Uh, so it's not maintainable, and I think what's going to happen is that the project is going to grind to a halt. The boss walked in and made a perfectly regular, you know, a perfectly normal statement. He wants another variable added. Uh, but if we tried to solve this problem like this, uh, we'd, you know, it's not going to work. Ah, okay, the solution. Here we go. So the solution is really, really simple. Don't make the fuel variable public in the first place. Make it private and use getters and setters. Very, very good. Okay, so, so at first glance, what we've done just here seems exactly the same as the previous class. We've just got uh, a private int this time, and we've got a get fuel and a set fuel method. So that's the getter and setter right there. Get fuel, set fuel. Uh, I'm sure you can see that there's nothing much to them. Uh, but they do save the scenario completely really, from uh, impending doom. Uh, the beauty, the beauty of using a getter and setter is that we know every single time the fuel variable is changed, it must go through this set fuel method. Because fuel is private. It's a private variable. So none of the external programmers can directly change the fuel variable. And none of the internal programmers can directly change the fuel variable either. Uh, everybody has to use the setter. Okay, that's good, which means that we've got an amazing trick up our sleeves. When the boss walks in and requests, once again, that a fuel gauge variable be added to the class and updated at all times that the fuel variable is updated, uh, we can just nod and uh, type a line or two of code, and we're done. The whole problem is fixed. For internal engineers and the external engineers, it doesn't matter. The problem's completely fixed. The fuel gauge variable will always be updated with the fuel variable. And... I mean, that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, this is an example, I guess, of uh, probably the the most common or, or one of the best ways to use uh, setters. And uh, in the above here, I've just incremented the fuel gauge variable to show that, you know, you can do any updating you want. Uh, you obviously wouldn't have to increment it there. You could do whatever you want. And the important thing is that uh, we've pretty much saved the problem. We've, we've, we've saved the... Uh, project from grinding to a halt and uh, adding this new variable that's synchronized with the fuel variable is you know exactly as easy as it should be. It's a couple of lines of code. Okay, so this is a kind of updated diagram of what I had before, uh, just showing that the internal project files are now all going through the set fuel method and the external libraries are also calling the set fuel method. They have to. They can't change fuel 
anymore because fuel is private. And uh, the set fuel method changes both the uh, fuel variable and the fuel gauge variable. Okay, so the moral of the story is that without a getter and setter, the fuel variable, or for the fuel variable, the addition of fuel gauge is really, really difficult, if not impossible. And if you were ever in that sort of a situation where you didn't have a getter and setter, and something like that come up, I think what you should do is, as soon as possible, uh, change the whole class to implement a getter and setter. You know, don't try and don't try and make the fix that I was talking about first, where you sort of tell everybody that they've got to change the two variables uh, at once, I think, because the fix is not going to work in the long run. You should probably implement a getter and setter as quickly as possible. Anyway, uh, maintaining a project without a getter and setter would uh, sometimes become just an ongoing endless frustration, and you just end up digging yourself into a hole and making more and more work. Anyway, if you design your class from the get-go with getters and setters, even if they seem pointless uh, at the time, eventually your boss is bound to walk in with some apparently simple request. And uh, if they're getters and setters instead of uh, public access to member variables, you may well save the whole project. As you can imagine, this type of scenario is not at all rare. Okay, good. Uh, on to a few more uh, examples of getters and setters. So one other way to use them is to validate input. Uh, if your boss walks in with the previous car and fuel example and he says something like, uh, there's some fellas around there. <laughs> there's some people that are inputting negative values for the fuel and this doesn't make sense. So you're going to have to um, make sure that the amount of fuel is zero or greater whenever it's changed for the uh, car instances. Uh, just as before, if we had to validate this without a setter, uh, we'd have to go back and find every time that the fuel variable was changed throughout the code, and we'd have to validate it there. You know, there'd be heaps of validations. Uh, as many validations as there are changes to the fuel variable, perhaps. Uh, but if we've got a setter, set fuel, then we can just do the validation there. We just say, if fuel is greater than or equal to zero, then set it. You know, otherwise we could do an error message or whatever. So validating input is a, a really good use for setters. Uh, read-only member variables with getters. Yes, we can very easily make read-only member variables by supplying a getter with no setter. Uh, right here I've made fuel read-only. So this car class now doesn't have a setter. There's no way to set the fuel variable anymore. The fuel variable is private, and the only method I've... Uh, made public, gets the value, but you can't set it. Fair enough. Read-only member variables. They're really common as well. So uh, use a getter if you like. Um, debugging with assert. Yeah, so this is similar to um, a couple of slides back when we we're looking at validating. Uh, if you're validating things on uh, sort of during the debugging process, uh, you might like to use assert just to make sure that certain conditions are true. Uh, so you can put your assert in a setter, something like assert fuel is greater than or equal to zero. And, uh, you know, whenever you're debugging, if uh, fuel for some reason is, uh, if somebody attempts to set fuel to some negative value, uh, you're going to get an assert failure. And you can fix that problem up. Debugging with assert. Good, good, good use for a setter. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, this is really cool as well. So, non-existent variables. Um, this is interesting, actually. You can make getters for variables instead of actually storing the variables so that they don't take up RAM. Uh, really, really cool, actually. So, for instance, if you imagine you've got a regular polygon class called regular polygon, and it's got two variables, uh, the number of sides and the length of the side. And imagine that throughout the program execution, you've got to know the area and the perimeter of the polygon. So you might be making, you know, triangles or squares or octagons or whatever you want, just different sorts of polygons in the program. And occasionally you want to calculate the area and the perimeter. Uh, you could do it like this if you like. So regular polygon, and then I've got a bunch of private variables here. I'm not sure why I made them private, but uh, they are private. So number of sides, side length, and then area and perimeter. And what you could do in the constructor for your polygon class is just calculate the area and perimeter and store them in these member variables. That would be absolutely fine, 
But what I want you to look at is this down here. So the size of, if you take the size of this regular polygon class here, you'll come up with 32 bytes. Pretty good. Whereas the other option that you can do is uh, instead of storing area and perimeter, uh, you can just write getters for them. Get area, get perimeter, and you can calculate them on the fly. So what's interesting about these two is that the size of this second class here is actually 16 bytes. It's half the size of this other one. So this other one stored an extra two doubles, and uh, each double is eight bytes long. So yeah, this second class here is half the size, 16 bytes. And here's just a little bit more detail. I thought I'd supply the um, yeah the full implementation of the class. So you can use getters and uh, never actually store the value of the perimeter and the area. Just calculate them on the fly. And this second class, like we said, is about half the size of the one that stores the area and the perimeter. So the change from 32 bytes to 16 is not often going to make a big difference if you're just dealing with a handful of instances of this class. But if you're talking about like a big database or a massive array, maybe there's millions, maybe there's tens of millions of instances of this regular polygon class. I mean, who knows? Who knows? But uh, on that kind of a scale, uh, the RAM saving uh, starts to make a big, big difference. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'll go from you'll go from sort of, you know, a gig of RAM to half a gig of RAM. That's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. Uh, anyway, here's how here's how the class works. So the get perimeter method would just return the number of sides by the side length and get area. <laughs> just uses some maths and does whatever it has to. It just gets the job done. Uh, anyway, I should also point out that uh, this will be slower. So get area right here uses, I think the uh, the particular trouble will be this tan just here. Uh, often, often the sign functions like tan, cos, sine, not the sign function, sorry, the uh, trigonometry functions are really, really slow. So if you're after speed optimization, you mightn't want to call tan. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it wasn't the point of the example. I digress. Alrighty, but in conclusion, anyway, digressions aside, uh, getters and setters are a technique for encapsulating controlling access to a class's member variables. Uh, really, all they are is a really common pattern that programmers use, and they're so common that they've been given a name. Getters and setters. So they're a tool for the promotion of maintainable code, and you can use them to validate class variables. You can use them to create read-only variables. Uh, you can use them for debugging assertions, and you can also use them sometimes to reduce the memory footprint of uh, the instances of a class. And there's probably countless other reasons to use getters and setters. Hopefully, hopefully the question has been answered, and uh, hopefully. Hopefully folks don't think, um, why don't we just make the, uh, why don't we just make the variables public? <laughs> Alright, thanks for listening. See ya.